so look, without further ado, I am going to request that Helen unmute herself because I suspect she doesn't realise she's on mute. Um, Stop it! And that, um, <laughs> you, didn't, did you? you didn't know. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I'm going to leave you, Helen, to crack on. Right, Get back lovely. to everyone a little bit later. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'm absolutely not the most tech savvy person in the world. In fact, I'm absolutely clueless. So I hope this works. <laughs> so essentially, um, I want to start just by saying, first of all, thank you very much um, for giving up your time this evening. I hope that I can provide you with some future holiday inspiration to a place that, like Chris, has undoubtedly just grabbed me. I've fallen completely and utterly in love with it. And it is undoubtedly one of my most favorite places on the planet, and that is Baja. So I'm gonna start with a slightly off the wall statement. Um, and I'm going to start by advising that in the office, we have a swear jar. And you're probably thinking, where on earth is she going with this? Well, said swear jar is in the shape of a wooden whale. And it was presented to me shortly after my very first trip to Baja back in 2017. Now I have a tendency to enthuse about most places that I come back from, but very quickly my colleagues realized that Baja was simply on another level. And when I didn't shut up about it for at least the first four days that I was back in the office, I was politely advised that I had to drop 20p into said swear jar every time the word Baja came out of my mouth. Needless to say, the swear jar has been filled time and time and time again. And it is now affectionately called the bar jar, if you get it. So without further ado, and metaphorically speaking, I'm going to add my 20p into the swear jar, the bar jar tonight. And I hope that I can try and get across just some of the magic that this incredible part of the world um, actually um, provide. And on that note, I can't move my presentation forward. Chris. Let's try this again. There we are. Now we've gone too far forward. Well, that's always a good start, isn't it? Right. Okie doke. So, <laughs> right. When I think of Baja, what comes to mind? Water-based wildlife, essentially, is what comes first and foremost to my mind. Imagine the sound and the sight of being surrounded by literally thousands of dolphins all around you, leaping through the waves, frolicking, breaching. They are incredible. They're not the only things that fly in this part of the world. I was surprised by mobular rays launching themselves out of the water just to slap back down seconds later. I was just held in awe at gliding turtles serenely passing you by at the might of an albatross trying to keep up with you, easily keeping up with you on uh, your boat trip as you're heading out into the ocean, of elephant seals, the smell of hundreds of seals uh, all in one place, from Californian seals, harbour seals, sea lions, more dolphins, crikey, you name it, the oceans are full. In fact, it's said that the Sea of Cortez, which is the eastern part of the Baja Peninsula, is home to a third of all known marine life that this planet supports. That's quite something for a relatively small area. Really though, what has put Baja on the map um, undoubtedly is whales. Not just any whales, you have the show whales, your humpbacks, you have your brooders, your boo, your minky, your sperm, your dwarf sperm, your fin, crikey, the list just goes on and on and on. And between late December, let's say January to April every year, Baja is an absolute mecca for anybody who has the slightest interest in whale life. 
not just the attraction of potentially seeing so many different types of whales. Baja has one particular whale that I believe offers an experience that you will get like no other whale watching on this planet. And that is provided courtesy of the utterly endearing and wonderful Pacific grey whale known as the friendly whale within Baja's waters. Grey whales collate in this area between January and April for two reasons. The first is to mate and the second is to calf. And when you're sitting at water level with a grey whale mother and her newborn calf just gliding along serenely next to your boat, sometimes ducking under it in these crystal clear waters, popping up the other side, teasing you with their proximity. Crikey, your heart just does a little flip and you start to burst quite simply. This is an adult. You can tell that by the barnacles that you can see on its head. Now, they're not actually, strictly speaking, barnacles, they're sea lice. And these creatures are bottom feeders, meaning that these lice attach themselves to the heads of the grey whales when they feed. And the older the whale, chances are the more lice that you'll be able to see. Youngsters, you can see the hair follicles just there on the nose and the top of the head of this particular youngster. Now, not only will you get up close and personal in terms of seeing these incredible creatures, you will get blown on as they exhale. You will be able to see down their nostrils when they inhale before they dive again. You will just be captivated by the fact that these inquisitive creatures are coming so close to you and rolling around in the water next to you wanting to check you out as much as you are checking them out. And if by chance you actually get to look into the eye of one of these creatures, into their very soul, crikey, your reaction can be like this. For some people, they just cry. It makes me quite emotional thinking about it now, actually, sorry. For some people, they just cry. For others, they literally laugh out loud like giggling schoolgirls. And Chris captured this moment with a client back in 2015. Can you imagine what is going through her head? You can see the complete and utter joy and exhilaration as she sees this incredible creature of the deep rising up next to her to get a better look at her as much as she wants a better look at it. It is an incredible, incredible achievement to really have been close to a whale on this scale. And I think until you actually experience it for yourselves, words just simply can't express. So I'm just gonna let this woman's picture do the talking because this is priceless, absolutely priceless. Oh, right. OK, get a grip, woman. <laughs> right. So where are we then? Um, where do we have to go to get up close and personal with grey whales, as well as this myriad of other marine wildlife that is on offer? Well, the grey whale is only found in the Pacific now. However, you do get odd isolated sightings in the Atlantic. They are very free, uh, infrequent, um, only twice in the last sort of uh, couple of decades. And the reason being is that they spend the summer months feeding in the high Arctic waters, the Beaufort Sea, the Chukchi Sea. They're up there north of the Aleutian mountain chain that you can see in Alaska across the top of this particular image. And most of them then come down the Pacific. There's a much larger population that come down into uh, the Eastern Pacific and follow the coastline of Canada and the States down into Baja, Mexico. There's a small population that goes across into the Western Pacific. 
hanging around by Korea, by Japan and in the high Russian Arctic. So if any of you have been lucky enough to join us on our Russian Arctic expeditions, you probably will have seen grey whales. Now, for the vast number of grey whale population that come down this American coastline, they make a 12,000 mile migration on an annual basis. So summer up in Alaska, they then follow that coastline down to Baja, arriving usually in late December. And then between January and April, you will find them in the Baja waters. As I say, they are there for two reasons. They are there to mate. And a year later, after that mammoth migration, they will return in order to give birth. The youngster will generally stay with the mother in Baja until April time, after which it too will commence that huge migration back up the coastline and into Alaskan waters for the summer. So it's toing and froing constantly, but they're in Baja between January and April. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in onto the Baja Peninsula itself. So it's just south of the Californian border. The Pacific coast dwarfs it to the west and to the south. And then the body of water that you can see to the east of the peninsula, that is the incredible Sea of Cortez. So this is a close up of the Baja Peninsula. You can see San Diego right up there in the northern part. And then you cross the Mexican border and the Baja Peninsula is entirely within the country of Mexico. In terms of getting there, you cannot fly direct uh, on any scheduled carriers. I know that Thomas Cook or TUI, I believe it was, um, started or were going to start last year a nonstop charter service in and out of Cabo San Lucas down in the south. But for our purposes, we access three airports within the peninsula of Baja. Loreto on the Sea of Cortez side that you can just see showed there, La Paz further south, and then down in the tip, Cabo San Lucas. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk you through two of our group trips that take you to Baja, California. And both of them are accessed through the USA. First one, we're going to go through is our grey whales of San Ignacio Lagoon. So if having heard just the introduction to this particular presentation and having been wowed by the grey whale potential, as I was before my first visit, then this is a trip that will focus purely and utterly on the grey whales. We fly you initially into Los Angeles. We overnight at an airport hotel there and then we board nine-minute flight down to Loreto on the Sea of Cortez the next day. From here, we board a minibus that will provide our journey of five to six hours across the peninsula to the Pacific coast and to San Ignacio Lagoon in particular. Now, the whale tails that you can see on this map at four different locations down the western south coast they all indicate whale breeding lagoons. But along this coast, there's an awful lot of salt industry as well. And we use San Ignacio Lagoon because it's untouched. You won't see buildings. You won't see signs of human life when you're there, other than the few eco camps that you'll find along the shores of San Ignacio Lagoon. It is untouched and it's a biosphere reserve. So all whale watching here is on the whales terms. Although it's a breeding lagoon, we're only able to access one quarter of that lagoon and only at certain times of the day and for restricted time periods each entry. So the conservation of these whales is at the forefront of the ecotourism industry. And I think that's really important to state. So what we do is on arrival at San Ignacio Lagoon, you generally get there at about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. 
it is pitch black. There is no light pollution as you get out of that vehicle and stretch your legs after your five to six hour journey across the peninsula. I urge you simply to look up. Cloud cover permitting, the stars will dazzle you. You'll fall into bed and the next morning there's no need for an alarm clock because you will be woken by the cries of osprey. There are always a number of different osprey nests in operation within the grounds of our camp and the male and the female will take it in turns to fly across overhead calling as they go carrying nesting material carrying food for their chicks. It's a wonderful sight. You can just park yourself with your binoculars and you can literally just watch these flybys all day. But that's obviously a bonus because what we're here to do is try and get up close and personal with these whales. This is one of my most favorite views in the world. You wake up, you were staying in beachside cabanas and each one of them has a veranda that overlooks the lagoon itself, and you just start scanning immediately. Subject to tide levels, you may at times be able to see plumes of air being blasted um, up, or water being blasted upwards by the whales. Um, they're usually a little bit further out to sea rather than close to shore, simply because the lagoon is very shallow, um, and therefore you can only um, you know, see the whales in the deeper trenches within the lagoon. But I love this view. I love it with the accompanying sound of the ospreys. You head down to the beach and evidence of in whale country is all around. This is their baleen. They don't have teeth, gray whales. Um, so if you imagine giant bristles on a toothbrush, this is what they have instead of teeth. And this enables them being filter feeders to simply squeeze the food and excess water out through these um, baleen plates. So um, there, and you find them just scattered along the beaches, evidence again that this is well and truly whale country. Boarding the pangas, we get straight out to it. It's a little bit like a safari. You have a morning and an afternoon excursion out onto the lagoon built into your stay. So we have five full days here. That means 10 whale watching excursions subject to weather, of course. It gets pretty windy in these parts and can get quite choppy. But you jump onto your panga and usually you're in the wonderful company of this living legend. This is Daniel. He is a whale whisperer, um, as are all of the guys that work at this particular camp. Um, he knows the whales, he knows quite a few of them individually because he lives on the lagoon and these whales have been coming back year after year after year. His skill will enable you to zoom out 20 minutes into the whale watching zone and you're scanning from the offset. Again, bird life just whilst you're getting there. You may well come across surf scoters, wimbrels, curlews, cormorants, thousands and thousands and thousands of cormorants. You'll come across terns, you'll come across pelicans and sooner rather than later you'll come across this telltale sign that you're not alone in the lagoon. The knuckles that form the back of these grey whales you become very accustomed to viewing and soon enough, you get close and personal with the mother and the calves. The 15 meter bulk of her, of the mother, as she approaches is just incredible. As I say, she'll blow on you, you'll get wet, put your cameras into Ziploc bags, but that's all part of the fun. But the sea lice that I talked about before, the individual markings, if you note the, the white patches that you have towards the right, of this whale's head. Those are very indicative. The older a gray whale gets and the more covered in scratches from its bottom feeding activities, the easier it is to identify particular individuals. It's the bond. Wherever the mother, you will find the baby and the baby won't be far away. And you get close to them. The baby, if you're lucky, will come up and look at you. They are such inquisitive creatures. So six nights here, 
and staying in these wonderful glorified garden sheds as Chris and I refer to them but my word they do the job you've got double rooms you've got twin rooms there's a sink in each room there is a loo in on each balcony and behind them there are shower blocks so they are communal showers don't let that put you off the whale experience is what you're here for the accommodation is simple but it absolutely does the job communal area yeah, generally you're going to spend quite a bit of time inside because the pacific wind is howling along here but all your meals are included it's a family run operation the family food is home cooked and it's fantastic there is beer there is wine it's all included and there's happy hour at 5 p.m every afternoon we like that very much so Obviously, by spending an extended period, six nights at the lagoon, you get to learn a lot about the whales as well as enjoy sightings with them. So you'll find them breaching, you'll find them fluking. This is quite unusual um, simply because whales need deeper water if they're going to fluke and then head under water. So this will be subject to the tide levels. You'll see them spy hop. You can just about see the eye of this adult peeking above the water. If the eye was submerged, it would be a head raise, but being slightly higher, this is a spy hop. It's checking out. It could be trying to see where the entry to the lagoon is. Um, there are sandbars blocking the entrance and with the tides, the whales move up and down the lagoon throughout the time that you're there subject to the tides. When we do dive, when we go underwater, the huge dispersal of water when they flick their tails up to propel them along creates footprints, otherwise known as fluke prints. I thought these were wonderful. They just look like elephants have been walking on the water, giant circular slabs of water completely just allowing you to follow where this animal is going underwater. Quite incredible. And always look up, not just for the stars at night, but also for squadrons of pelicans and said cormorants and everything that I mentioned before. There's so much to see here, so many flybys. It's a whale and birding extravaganza. But you are on the Pacific and you're not always going to be able to get out on the water. If you are out on the water, at least once during your stay, you will have a chance to explore mangroves that are just to the north and to the south of the lagoon entrance. Here, you'll glide through the mangroves looking at the fish. These things are a mecca for herons and egrets. And um, again, if you can't actually get out on the water, you might be lucky enough to come across coyotes. There are excursions that can be done inland. We can take you to salt flats. We can take you on birding walks through giant forests of cardon cacti, taller than like a three-story building. These things are huge. We can take you to rock paintings, carved. People have the Baja Peninsula for centuries. Um, there's an awful lot to do in the area, but obviously our main focus is bird watching and whale watching and literally just spending the end of every day with a cold beer in your hand, just being thankful that you're in this magical place. Now, the greys are there. What you might also want to do is see a few more of the other whale species. You've gone all that way, why not try and have a pop at the others as well? For this, I'm gonna take you on to our second group tour that we offer in the area. And this is the Great Whales of Mexico's Pacific Coast. For this particular trip, you're on a boat, not just any boat, you are on the magnificent searcher. She is a naturalist boat based in San Diego that heads down the coast offering naturalist tours between January and April. We do a private charter with her twice a year. Next year, we have February and April departures already in place. And this vessel is a humdinger. The minute I set foot on her, I loved her. 
My first visit to Baja was aboard the wonderful searcher. She has a crew of seven who will make it their mission from sundown to oh, sun up to sundown to find you as much wildlife as they possibly can. And coming back to the map, just to talk you through this particular itinerary, we fly initially into San Diego. We overnight in San Diego, and then we make our way slowly down the coast, seven nights aboard Searcher, stopping at various island groups along the way, heading to San Ignacio Lagoon, where you will moor for one night. So you'll be there for two full days and weather permitting eight grey whale excursions. Then we come on down to Magdalena Bay. This is a blue whale hotspot. We had four blue whales in um, one day. The year after us, I think they believe they had six blue whales in one sighting, which is insane, but rather marvellously so. We had brooders whales, we had humpbacks, we came across migrating grey whales, um, and you head on further south around the tip of the Baja Peninsula and you enter a humpback whale breeding area. From here, you come back to Cabo San Lucas and after seven nights aboard Searcher, you're able to fly straight back to the UK via Phoenix usually. So we use American Airlines back up to the States in order to connect with a BA overnight flight home. Now, in terms of Searcher, the minute you leave San Diego, marina crikey it all starts to happen the first day is very much a traveling day you've entered mexico that's all done for you you don't have to do anything in terms of immigration and customs you've entered mexico and the wildlife extravaganza begins my first day memory is dolphins dolphins and more dolphins but you may come across migrating grays and also blues at this point if you're lucky now, a lot of people stand by the bow when you're first taking photos of the dolphins. We have a wraparound deck on Searcher and I would encourage you to use every square meter of it. Um, you can get different angles of leaping um, dolphins as you do. The pelagic bird onslaught starts immediately. Auklet, shearwaters, booby as you've got here, it just goes on and on. You spend a day at West San Benito Island, and this is an elephant seal nursery. There are hundreds of elephant seals. You step over them, some in a process of catastrophic molt, as you can see at the back here. It's also home to Guadalupe fur seals, if you're very lucky. They are endangered. We were lucky enough to see them. A great hiking day. You then continue further south, and you enter San Ignacio Lagoon for all of the wonderful grey whale experiences previously on through. Leaving San Ignacio Lagoon behind you, we continue further south. And as you head further south down the peninsula, you spend the day off Magdalena Bay, just offshore. And as I say, this is a blue whale mecca. This was our very first blue whale. And really just to talk you through the incredible skill of the crew. This was a juvenile, so it's only a little one. And we were able to spend one and a half hours with this creature. We got to the point where it was just off our bow. We were able to take selfies with a blue whale, which is just insane. And again, a whole heap of whales, brooders, humpbacks, all in this area, and just something to behold, quite frankly. You've got bait balls. So we started to see frigate birds being in the tropics for one whole day as you round the tip of Baja and also red-billed tropic birds. We had Californian sea lions. We had a brood as whale. We had orca. Now, this is very unusual, but there is an Eastern Pacific tropical orca. It's not commonly seen. We were very fortunate and we were able to. Really off the southern tip of Baja, this is humpback country. This is how I'd always seen humpbacks prior to this particular trip. Down here, they put on quite a show. 
I know Chris had a fantastic experience of a humpback just gliding right in front of the bow on his last trip there. We had flipper slapping, we had tail slapping. Another individual here, you can see how different the tail is, more tail slapping. We had breaching, we had double breaches. It was just insane how much wildlife we had as we made our way all the way down through the Baja Peninsula to the tip. Now, you can leave us there after your seven nights aboard Searcher, but I would thoroughly recommend doing our Sea of Cortez extension, which is a three night stay, land based. We stay in a property overlooking the Sea of Cortez from La Paz, and here we explore the offshore islands and the desert element of this incredible environment comes to the fore here. You can walk through cacti forests. You can get up close and personal with Sally Lightfoot crabs, with all the bird life in the area. You can come across seals, sea lions. You can get in the water with them. This particular big male preening at the front here, he actually um, was quite happy to come very, very close to us um, as we were snorkeling with him. And also from the Paz, there are whale sharks. So on our extension, you have the chance to go looking for whale sharks one morning. And if you're lucky, getting in the water with them. I was so fortunate to be able to swim with five of them. And quite frankly, the experience blew me away. So crikey, there's a lot to see. So whether you just stick to San Ignacio Lagoon, whether you do our search a boat based trip all the way down the peninsula, or in fact, go and spend more time in the Sea of Cortez. We're able to do tailor-made self drives. We can do car and driver transfers all across the peninsula. If we went back to Loreto, halfway down the eastern side of Baja on the Sea of Cortez, this is another blue whale hotspot. So at the time that we visit, February into March, that is the highest chance that you have of seeing blue whales over that period. Now, Chris is very good friends with Simon Barnes, a writer and journalist that you may well have traveled. He, he goes to Zambia with us on an annual basis. And I'm just going to leave you with a quotation from him. I love this. It's not just blue whales, however. I'm almost tempted to take out blue whale and replace it with the word Baja. And then you'll have a really good idea of just how magical this peninsula is. And I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm gonna give you a chance just to read through that. And Chris, anything to add? When can I go? When can I go back? I should be saying, really, shouldn't I? That was uh, fantastic, Helen. Thank you very much. Just taking my Hello. background off because um, otherwise I look like I'm floating, which is all a bit peculiar. Um, I'm goodness. just going to move on to the next slide for you when my laptop decides to work. <laughs> um, It'll work at some stage, Helen. At least we've managed to get to the end of the talk. I know, and I'm sorry. I think I probably went slightly over time. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, so, uh, goodness gracious, that, 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 that was fantastic. You're so enthusiastic about it. You're almost as enthusiastic about it as I am. Uh, it is one of the most incredible places on earth, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, crikey. I get quite, I really do get quite emotional. I know it's ridiculous. Well, I do as well. I mean, I, yeah, well, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously hopeless. I, I turn to jelly when I talk about this place. Uh -huh. I absolutely turn to jelly. Look, we've had a number of really interesting questions, which I'm going to throw in your direction. Um, okay, um, no oh, pressure. Uh, yeah, no pressure. Um, so, um, and we can answer them together if you like. Anyway, we'll see. Let's see. Yeah, anyway, you go for it. So, so um, Claire Carroll asked um, towards the beginning of the, of the presentation, um, and Claire, um, if you're still on board, which I hope you are, I'm just going to elaborate on your question a little bit. Um, but the best months to go, Helen, perhaps maybe I'll, I'll elaborate on that a bit and just perhaps can you just sort of tell us a bit about the season and, and how it works? 
Yeah, so due to the migratory uh, nature of all whales, um, then, you know, essentially it's not really until January that you have a higher likelihood of seeing the whales. Now, what happens with the grey whale lagoons in particular is that the males are down there with one thing on their minds. And once they have indulged that one thing, they very quickly then start to head north again and start that massive migration back up to um, Alaska. The reason being is that when they're down in Baja waters, they don't actually feed. So whales are living off fat reserves over that period. So if you want to see lots of adults and you potentially want to see mating behavior, go in January or February. After that, the males will head back up north. Many of the newly pregnant females will also start to depart the lagoons because they also need to get back up and feed. So the whales that remain later in the season, as you go into March and into April, the females remain in the Baja waters um, in order to build up the musculature of the calves for that massive migration north. So they are running with the tides and they're using the tides to exercise their calves and then they begin to head north as well. So the calves are often a bit bolder later in the season. So if you go in April, the calves are older, they're used to the boats, they're, you know, they're, they're, and they will often approach the boats much more readily. That said, the females often push the calves towards the boats to have a good look at us as we're having a good look at them. Um, so I suppose, yes, if you, want, if you want more whales, then probably January um, and into February. But if you want really good, um, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, sightings with bolder calves, then you want to go later. So into March and April. Thank you very much. That, that is, uh, that, that's very, very good. And, um, and yeah, and I think it's probably worth saying that um, the later period it with there being fewer whales in the lagoon doesn't mean to say that the that the observations that you have are any less no absolutely you know they, they, of, you still yeah. have just as many observations don't you i've been earlier in the season and later in the season there was you know you you, you just you just wouldn't know you kind of you kind of can't tell the difference no absolutely yeah and i think that the young ones and probably the mothers as well are probably in towards the end of that period they're, they're, they're getting bored so they, they they do kind of want to see what's going on they've been in the lagoon for a few months and they're you know they want to see what see what's what to make maybe you get um you know more of the spy hopping and all that kind of behavior later in the season absolutely yeah um, so a, a related question then um uh are there many other people, this um, is a question from Catherine, um, are there many other people whale watching in the lagoon? You know, is it busy, is it crowded, as if you were whale no. watching for argument's sake off the coast of uh, California, further north, or, or perhaps off the coast of Boston, let's say? Yeah, no, absolutely not. Am I going to see not. a lot of people, that's the thing. Yeah, because you're in a biosphere reserve and they realise just how precious um, the whales are, um, you know, obviously in terms of rising sea levels, in terms of rising water temperatures and so on, um, you know, some behaviour is changing. But what you find in the lagoon is that when they enter the lagoon, the lagoon is actually huge. It's 16 miles long and your the whale watching zone is right at the entrance to the lagoon and it's only a quarter of the lagoon. Now you're allowed a maximum of 16 pangas in that whale watching zone at any one time, and they can only be present between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. So for the rest of the day, the whales are left completely to their own devices. Now, between those hours of eight and four, every time you enter the lagoon, you can only do so for a maximum of 90 minutes and it's strictly controlled. 
when you go into the lagoon, you wave at a bloke over on the edge of the, of the uh, you, you've done it as well. Hola. And, yes. Hopefully <laughs> and you're he, waving at the right bloke, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he basically is a marshal um, and um, he will basically monitor that no more than 16 boats go into the lagoon. And because there are so many whales, um, what actually happens is, you know, you, you, when, when you, there are whales everywhere um, and you just sort of sit um, or, you know, just sort of occupy a certain area and the whales will be going past you constantly with the tides. Now, if they come to the boat, they come to the boat and it's their decision to do so. They come and check us out. We do not follow them. We do not chase them. There is absolutely no um you know hounding of these creatures whatsoever um sometimes you end up going out and not having an interaction you won't have the whales coming very close to you but you'll still be seeing lots of whale activity all around you so ultimately the fact that you're so close to the whales and you're not sharing these whales with other people is absolutely ideal and the marshal that you have to as you go in that's always one of the fishermen who is um you know driving the boat so they take it in turns all of the eco camps on the lagoon's edge so the people who are taking you into the lagoon are one day a week going to be the people that are monitoring that you're you know, adhering to conditions set. So it's all very, very well done. And it's all making sure that the whales are looked after as number one, quite frankly, which is how it should be. And I think you and I have both said, I mean, A, how lucky we've been to be able to go to some amazing places, but but also um, when it comes to, um, uh, if you like, sort of um, wildlife, preservation and and the way that the um this reserve is operated it's probably operated better than any other place or so, probably better than I any would, other place I've ever yeah. in the way I that, would say uh, so. in the way that it's policed i mean it's it's quite mm. exceptionally good yeah um so uh, so um a couple of the boats look quite small don't they so a couple of people have asked questions about the boats you know what is it Susan has asked um what size are the boats and um I, I will elaborate on that because somebody else has asked it you know um uh, is it dangerous do you think it's dangerous uh, and, and any of the boats get um you know I mean, is, is, is it dangerous being in these small boats with with whales around you have to be aware that you know th these these animals have the capacity to flip you <laughs> um you know any whale watching quite frankly that that is you know potential but that's really why um it is so well pleased to make sure that these whales never feel threatened and that they never feel concerned or that you're in their way or that you're affecting their natural behavior so um the, the boats are small um there are times when you just need one or you know um that usually have five rows of seats you probably have maximum of 10 people on one of these boats and if a whale comes to one side of the boat if you all went to that side of the boat to take a photo you'd probably want two or three people sticking on the other side for ballast and that's usually me <laughs> and um, you know but um yeah I, I for one have never felt uh, unsafe so I've been to this lagoon three times now, and like you, I would very much hope that I can go back every year uh, for the rest of my life as long as I'm able, because it's that captivating. I've never felt unsafe. I've never had any concern um, from a safety point of view. Um, and I think just, you know, you know, there is such a respect for these whales. Um, and they, you know, their their, their behaviour is never compromised, and therefore, and I think as a result of that, they they are quite calm in our presence. Yeah. And you can actually see the personalities. You get the playful ones, you get the shy ones, you get, um, you know, the bolder ones, and uh, and I think that it's it's just such a privilege to be able to spend time with such a mighty creature you know i mean the calves are four meters long just when they're all say crikey <laughs> these things are massive and they're not even a big whale you know they're half the size of a blue but um they're, they're, they're just magic they're magic they are fantastic aren't they um um i think i need to get back there quite urgently actually <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 
so um so look a couple of couple of questions then about accommodation i've had a couple of questions about the accommodation um uh on searcher and what's the mm -hmm. accommodation like on searcher and um, you and i have both been on it but um I, i'll pose that question to you but also um so, uh, that question was from Liz and someone else as well has asked that. Um, and Catherine has asked, what's the accommodation like on the extension? I mean, I can say before you say your, your bit, I can say in both cases, absolutely fabulous. But um, yeah. you'll be a bit more detailed perhaps than me. OK, right. So Searcher. Oh, God, I love this boat. I could live on this boat, I reckon. Um, right. So accommodation, um, you, it's, it's mixed. You've got as you walk on to Searcher's um, back deck, um, onto the stern, you walk into a salon area, the lounge, communal area where there's a galley kitchen um, and where there are um, four loos, two, two of which have showers in them and four loos. Um, on that top level, or the, you know, the, the living area level, you have two cabins. Um, they're the same size as all the cabins downstairs, but they have the ability to open windows. So um, if you if you feel fresh air is very, very important, then you're going to ask for one of those two cabins on um, the main living level. When you go downstairs, um, you've got a number. Most cabins basically have two twin berths. They are, um, they're, they're tidy, um, <laughs> so that, you know, they're, they're not large by any stretch of the imagination. So you walk in and you will have um, two twin berths that are done as bunks, essentially. There's an upper bunk and a lower bunk. You'll have a um, charging socket. You will have a sink with a mirror. You will have air conditioning. Um, so that's quite plush. Um, and you will have plenty, in fact, of storage space. Um, the, 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 it's open underneath the bottom bunk, so all your luggage will just fit quite snugly underneath the bottom bunk, and there's also shelving units for you. So, um, you know, you're not going to have parties in these rooms. They are, they're small, but they do the job. Um, there are one or two cabins that have um, four berths in them, two upper and two lower. And again, we can, you know, um, essentially, we wouldn't put more than two people into those. Um, so they could, you know, essentially they're available as well. Um, there are limited single route, single cabins, um, but they're really very comfortable. They come with everything you need. They come with blankets, they come with pillows. Um, there are handrails on the wall. So if you're going through a bumpy crossing at night, you've got something to hold on to if needs be. And um, I, uh, they come with a little welcome kit that's got like trail mix in it. And, you know, um, it, oh, it just, I, I, I thought they were absolutely marvelous. Um, and the whole boat is entirely clad wall to ceiling in gray carpet so that it got some, you know, to hold on to if it's a little bit bumpy. But don't, you know, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> as long as you like gray carpet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Look, uh, the, 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 the final question I'm going to ask you, because I'm conscious we're cruising towards 8.30, um, is that, that, that someone has asked, um, uh, is that you and I have both had fantastic whale watching experiences down there, right? Just been mm -hmm. brilliant. And people we know have had fabulous whale watching experiences down there as well. But how guaranteed is it? What's the likelihood of seeing whales? Let's say, for example, you went. Let's say, let's say you you, you were you, you were booking onto a trip, um, and going on the um, on the trip to the lagoon, just the lagoon with you. How likely is it that um, that you'll see grey whales? If you're booking on the trip on Searcher with me, how likely is it you'll see whales? And if so, therefore, are they going with you or are they going with me? <laughs> well, I keep telling you, we need to swap on an annual basis. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, as, uh, for as many years as we've been running these trips, we've never not seen whales. Um, you know, they have to go there to breed. They have to go there to give birth. Um, so uh, unless, uh, unless something drastic happens um, to the whale population, they're, they're going to go there. So um, you've got every chance, really, of seeing them. Now, we're never going to guarantee anything, but I would be gobsmacked if we sent anyone to Baja and they didn't see whales. Absolutely gobsmacked. Well, I agree with you entirely. Yeah, it's um, it's it's one of the best, isn't it? It's one of the best mm -hmm. trips you could possibly do. One of the yeah. most beautiful places on earth. I'm 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 absolutely convinced of that. 
Look, I, I've still got questions coming in, but it's it's 8.30 and I'm not going to um, um, detain uh, people any longer. Um, Helen, thank you so much. You're so enthusiastic about Baja, uh, second Thanks. only to me, obviously. <laughs> obviously but you are fantastic. <laughs> and, you're, and your talks are, uh, are so brilliant. Lovely photography, just great. Absolutely brilliant. Everything about it is Some brilliant. Some of them were yours. He, he asked for that, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> that was, there was only one of mine, all the rest of yours. <laughs> Um, so look, uh, to everyone that's on board, I know that a lot of you have um, seen our talks before. Um, I will be emailing you um, a little bit later this evening. Um, uh, and um, as always, we are incredibly, incredibly grateful to you for um, taking uh, time out of your evening to, uh, to he hear and, and see our, our presentation. So thank, thank you very, very much indeed for that. Please don't forget we've got a new brochure available. We will remind you um, in your uh, in your um, in your email. That was my reminder, subtle reminder to you, Helen. Well done. Yeah, well done. Um, 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 uh, so I'll remind you in the email. Um, and um, the next presentation, which we have on Tuesday, is about UK photography workshops. And just before you go, I'm going to say. Uh, to you, Helen, that I have people asking about availability to travel next year and one or two other people saying, what a fantastic talk. I can't wait to go. Um, great. Hey, thank you very we much. Have good, we have good availability, so do come. <laughs> it would be great to travel with you and the beer is cold and the sun's shining. It's marvellous. Yes. Well, <laughs> the beer is cold in my fridge as well. Um, <laughs> hey, thanks very, very much indeed. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>